Here, read this. Woof. Hey everybody, Ash here from the Ear Read This podcast. Uh, just a little short video, a kind of bonus video uh, to my last podcast, which was on Bridget Brophy's novel, The Snowball. Check it out if you haven't already. I particularly recommend it to fans of Sylvia Plath who might have uh, watched or listened to some of my Sylvia Plath uh, stuff. Uh, Bridget Brophy is a, a brilliant author, an author that's come to mean quite a lot to me and um, I'm, I'm getting more and more into. It's a writer I've discovered relatively recently, only in the last few years. But uh, the more I read about her, the more I read of her stuff, the more the more I like her. And um, I think The Snowball in particular will appeal to fans of Sylvia Plath. Uh, Brophy deserves to resist comp- too much comparison to other authors. We actually uh, discussed this, me and my guest, Kate Levy, who is Brophy's daughter. We discussed uh, some contentious comparisons that Brophy has sometimes attracted from Iris Murdoch, her friend and uh, possible lover, um, as well as uh, Virginia Woolf, which uh, Kate was very keen to, um, to argue that one in particular. I've no idea what Kate might think of the following comparison, so um, apologies in advance, but I, I did think that some of the, the imagery choices in the snowball, as well as the sheer concentration of that imagery, the density, I, I always come back to the word density with Plath, and I know I used it in regards to Brophy as well. The density and control of how the imagery is used impresses upon you before you even started to try and decode it or, or, or plumb its depths. It gives you the unavoidable sense of, of, a, of a powerful subtext. Um, I've spoken to so many fans of Plath who have said words to that effect, they've put it better than I've just said it there. That initial sort of thrill of reading a Plath poem where you can sense the immense intelligence before you've been able to sort of intellectually grasp what's going on. I think that is something that that Brophy shares. You can read the whole novel, have a great time on that first read through and be aware that there are things going on that require more attention if, if you're going to uh, if you're going to delve a bit deeper. So first of all, the purpose of this video is to uh, recommend the book, first and foremost, go and read The Snowball by Bridget Brophy, especially, I think, if you're into Plath. Also listen to the podcast, and Brophy's not as high profile as some of the other authors I talk about, so um, I, I'd love it for you to, to check that out. But really, the, the main focus of today's uh, video is to share with you this extraordinary discovery I made um, whilst researching and putting assembling my podcast. Uh, the, the podcast, I, I tried to include as many different aspects of the snowball that interested me as possible. It, it probably veers around a bit more than than a few of my podcasts do. What I wanted to do was get across the, the enjoyment of how many different possible kind of systems of imagery there are in the book. So, for example, there's a whole scheme of, of egg imagery. There's a whole scheme of undersea imagery, and uh, that led me through talking about that in connection to themes of uh, female agency, female empowerment, and uh, and ravishment, to talking about octopuses. Now, there is a, there's a pretty famous article, essay, by a writer called Gerard cohen Renault. I may well be mispronouncing that, I apologise, um, about the octopusy, this, this figure of... Um, a female empowerment that emerged following a novel by uh, Victor Hugo called The Toilers of the Sea, featuring this octopus attack uh, that performs a, a sort of inversion of male ravishment. So an, an octopus attacks and basically it's not pornographic or anything, but it attacks them in a way that, that seemed to carry an undercurrent of, of sexual fear. Anyway, I talked a bit about that in the podcast and I, then I moved on to talking about uh, Cupid and leader and eggs, all of this egg imagery that's in the in the book, uh, broken eggs, the eggs that are constantly embedded into bits of Rococo decoration. Uh, there's paintings of eggs, there's crystal eggs, there's uh, the sedan chair is compared to an egg that is hatched. The main character is rather bizarrely offered a snack of boiled eggs midway through a, uh, a costume ball. And perhaps I was getting a little bit too much like this sort of caffeinated conspiracy theorist at this point, but I, I started thinking like, hang on a second, octopusy, jeweled eggs, female empowerment. No, that doesn't work. But the first two, that's triggering James Bond. So I had a weird moment of sort of walking around for a bit going, 
Is it just some weird coincidence that octopusy and, and sort of jeweled eggs... There's not a literal Fabergé egg in the snowball, but there is but there is a jeweled egg and magical hatchings from egg referenced in art that uh, make me think of the Fabergé egg surprise. There's also a lot of... Well, not a lot. There's, there's references to Anna Karenina, and I think there's a little bit of a possible reference to a, a Russian empress, Anna Ivanova, from the 18th century, who... Well, there's a famous painting of her, and there, there are just too many things in common with that painting and this book, and some of Brofree's tastes, I think, for that for there not to be some kind of connection. Anyway, what I'm trying to say is I had Fabergé eggs in my head, as well as octopuses, and I was trying to, for the life of me, work out why the hell I was getting sort of James Bond connotations in this book. So I start doing some research, and I start looking up Ian Fleming, Bond, Bridget Brophy, and... To my amazement, this is what I discovered. So this is the first thing I found from April uh, 1963, a review by Bridget Brophy called Bottle Bond. It's a roundup review of six books, including Honor Majesty's Secret Service by Ian Fleming. I'll read you a little bit of this review. It should serve, if you haven't read Brophy before, as a fulsome recommendation. I can't share the highbrow disapproval of Bond. Sex, sadism and snobbery are the counts against him, but much nastier doses of the last two go unscalded elsewhere, and what's wrong with the first? One might more reasonably complain that Bond isn't sexy enough. He goes at it with such bounce, like a really healthy curate, and so quickly, an hour later, James Bond slipped out of bed without waking her, as to cast doubt on his experience. But that was just the start. At the beginning of this review, she references a pastiche that had been written in the same month, April 1963, by Cyril Connolly, a pastiche of Bond. So, of course, I wanted to look that up. And that is where I really hit the jackpot. I found this. It's the London Magazine from April 1963, Volume 3, Issue Number 1. The first item is Bond Strikes Camp by Cyril Connolly, an extravaganza. Uh, I read it. It is basically a camp send-up of Bond. This in itself was a bit of a marvel. Um, one of the threads to my Snowball um, podcast was Brophy and Camp. She's an, a very important uh, writer in terms of camp literature. She wrote an enormous book dedicated to the praise of Ronald Furbank. But her own novels, too, have an important place in the canon of, of camp literature, camp modernism. So, yes, Bond Strikes Camp, which I managed to... to uh, extract the PDF of. It's a short Bond adventure in which M calls Bond in with a rather unusual uh, mission objective. He is to drag up and seduce a uh, Russian count, I think, who is a sodomite. So despite being a stern, uh, famously stern heterosexual, Bond is also a man of honour, and uh, so he duly goes and gets himself tarts up ends up in the bedroom of this uh, Russian general or count who turns out to be a uh, love-struck M in disguise. It's a marvellous bit of pastiche, which apparently Fleming approved of. I think him and Cyril Connolly um, got on. So that was a laugh in itself. But it was actually the other contents of that magazine which uh, really blew me away. Let me just get back to the cover page. So Bond Strikes Camp by Cyril Connolly. And now look at the other contributors. Okay, we've got Ezra Pound by Robert Conquest. Not so interested in that right now. We've got Bridget Brophy and Michael Levy. That's both of Kate, my guest's parents. So Bridget Brophy was collected in this issue of the magazine writing about something else completely. It was a review. I forget exactly of what. Oh, yes, it was a pretty scathing review of a book called The Anatomy of Satire. But the bit that really did just bring things completely full circle for me was... Yes, another contributor to this one issue of the London magazine, Sylvia Plath. Sylvia Plath has seven poems in this issue, uh, including uh, some of the bee poems. She has bee meeting. She has stings, uh, subject of an upcoming episode on Air Read This, just to let you know. Cut, the poem that begins, What a thrill, my thumb instead of an onion. I've been thinking of that poem a lot recently because I've just, uh, you can't really see now, but I, I managed to cut my hand open the other day on a tuna can. So I was thinking that as I was getting my stitches done. It also includes Letter in November, The Courier's, Mary's Song, and Years. 
That I thought was just extraordinary because, again, I don't want to compare them because they're, they're very different writers, but just on a personal level, a lot of the things I like about Sylvia Plath, I felt were things I liked about Bridget Brophy. Temperament, concentration, density, whatever you want to call it. So to see them collected in the same issue, especially because although I'd clocked, they would have been, you know, contemporaries, just about. I hadn't come across anything that, that sort of put them in the same net in the way that Brophy and Murdoch are often compared. Um, I think sometimes less stylistically, but more because they crossed paths, not only were they in a relationship, but early on, I, I think Brophy won an award that they were both up for. I think Brophy won it for her first novel, beating Murdoch's first novel. I'm a bit, sh bit sketchy on the details, but something like that. Something that will then inevitably put those two authors constantly in comparison in the public eye. But I'd never come across that with Plath and Brophy. So to, to see them in this issue that also contained this errant James Bond motif was just staggering. And uh, I didn't really know what to make of it. I didn't even really know how to describe it. But I, I wanted to tell you about it because at least, if especially if you'd listened to the podcast, you would you would be able to share just how um, balmy that, that felt um, discovering that. And of course, if you've clocked the date, April 1963... That's two months after Plath died. So those would be amongst her first uh, posthumously published poems. Obviously, some of the aerial poems. The trajectory of posthumous Plath was, uh, you know, just starting. It, it was, it's quite shivery to, uh, to sort of see it at this early stage. Anyway, never done a video like that before, just sharing the weird sort of um, coincidence of research. But, um, but there you go. If you do get a chance to listen to it, let me know what you think of the Brophy episode. Would love to do more about Brophy. There's there's people I'd like to interview. There's there's definitely books I'd like to talk about. There's a ton of plath stuff on the way, so I don't need to uh, don't need, don't need to ask for any encouragement on that count. That's about it for today, though. Uh, happy reading, and I'll see you next time.